Hello and welcome to the ISA Innovative Pedagogy Initiative webinar focused on pandemic pedagogy. We're really glad that you could join us and give us a chance to talk more about key themes related to facing pedagogical challenges in an unprecedented era. This webinar is designed to give an overview of some of the themes that will develop more fully in the live workshop scheduled for Monday, August 3rd. We'll tell you more about that in just a few minutes. We want to begin by thanking our sponsors who have enabled this important set of programs, including our webinar and our live workshop. Um, they include the International Studies Association broadly and the staff and leadership support, the ALIAS section of ISA, the International Education section of ISA, the ISA journal International Studies Perspectives, and a direct gift donation from professors Mark Boyer and Paul Deal to support this initiative. This is a chance for us to engage with teacher scholars from around the world who are committed to learning more about pandemic pedagogy, including our presenters for today's webinar. So I'm very pleased to introduce our group. I'll begin, my name is Jeff Lantis. I'm a professor of political science at the College of Worcester, and I'm the director of the ISA Innovative Pedagogy Initiative. My colleagues are here with us. My name's Jamie Free. I'm a professor at Bridgewater College in Virginia director of the Center for Engaged Learning there, and a member of the planning committee for the Innovative Pedagogy Initiative. Hi, I'm Amanda Rosen. I'm associate professor and associate director of the Teaching Excellence Center at the US Naval War College. I'm also the section chair of the International Education section of ISA. And any views I express in this webinar are my own and don't represent those of the War College, the Department of Defense, or the US government. And I'm Eric Leonard. I'm a professor of political science at Shenandoah University, uh, director of the Global Studies Program and the College of Arts and Sciences Teaching and Learning Advisor. So as you can see, we have a terrific group here uh, ready to share some ideas with you in this asynchronous webinar. And then there'll be important voices and leaders in our upcoming live workshop as well. Jamie Free is going to tell you a little bit more about what to expect in the next little bit in the webinar. So our webinar today is designed to introduce some themes that we're going to explore more in more depth when we come to the August workshop. We're going to start with Eric talking a little bit about the uh, strategic approaches to hybrid and online education and exploring ways, attitudes that you can bring to those uh, challenging environments that may be new to you in important ways. And then we're going to have Amanda talk a little bit about some of the practical, tactical things that you can do in order to make a difference in your classes. These are meant to empower your agency to think about your creativity, including things that might help in your classes, but mostly just as an example of ways that you yourself can make a difference in thinking through the ways to connect your students, even if you're not in person. So in order to get started, we'll just kick it over to Eric, who's gonna to talk to us a little bit more about those attitudes I mentioned. Thank you for joining us. Hi, and uh, welcome to the Pandemic Pedagogy webinar. Um, I'm Eric Leonard. I am going to do a short little webinar today in which I am going to talk to you about kind of a broad introduction to hybrid and online learning, um, discuss some broader strategic approaches to this. Um, this is really intended as kind of a preview to our live uh, virtual workshop that we'll be doing on Monday, August 3rd. All right. This is where I like to start when I talk about online learning uh, with that sort of phrase, because I think I've heard that more than any other phrase when I talk to people about online or, or even hybrid learning. And that is, oh my God, I just, I hate this stuff. Um, so I always like to start with a little story about why I embraced online learning at the outset so that people understand where I'm coming from. Um, so, I'm at a small university in the northwest corner of Virginia, Shenandoah University, and my wife and I are both from New Jersey. We lived out there for about nine years, 
enjoyed it. It was great. It was nice. Um, but we always wanted to get back to New Jersey. And as we all know, in higher ed, you don't always get to pick where you live. So it made things kind of difficult. Um, we were lucky enough that uh, we had a house from my wife's family at the Jersey Shore. So if I were to pick up this computer, and I actually do this with my students when I do my introductory videos and walk out my door, I can look two blocks to my left and I will hit the ocean and I can look one block to the right and I can hit the bay. To be perfectly honest, that's why I started off playing around with hybrid and online learning mm, close to 10 years ago now. It was personal, it was selfish. I wanted to continue to work at Shenandoah University. I loved it there, but I also wanted to live at the beach and be near the ocean. I'm a, I'm a surfer. I love the water. Um, it's just where I, 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 I love to be more than anything else. My wife, my kids, same thing. So that's why I sort of embraced this. But what I began to learn as I started to play with this was that this was massively beneficial um, on a whole host of levels. And I've actually gotten to the point now that None of my classes um, are taught without some sort of online or remote component to it. Um, bulk of my classes are hybrid classes where we'll be online on Tuesdays and in class on Thursdays. Um, but I also do a lot of complete online learning. And I tell my students this story at the outset of every semester too as to why I started this journey and why I do this. And I explain to them that if everything changed tomorrow and all of a sudden I was living across the street from campus, I would still do remote learning in my classes, at least in some capacity, um, at least in the, in the hybrid ver version. So the big question is, should you embrace remote learning? What sort of benefits and drawbacks does this have? Um, this is a in many ways a personal question about your pedagogy and whether you think it fits and whether you think it works. Um, to some degree, uh, in the spring, uh, all of us were put in a place where you didn't have a choice, you had to embrace it. But as my university described it in the spring, that was crisis mode. Get through, do what you had to do, um, turn on the Zoom camera and go. Whereas I think this fall, if you're going to have to embrace this in either a hybrid or an online capacity, you know, they're going to expect that you do it better. Um, and some of you may fall into it like me, where you come to this in one way and yet stay in this remote learning world um, as you progress forward. So a few benefits that I think uh, you get out of this. For me, it made me a better educator. I've been teaching for 20 plus years now, and I will be the first to say that at some point my uh, teaching got stale. Um, very easy to walk into a class and teach 50 minutes on security issues and international relations to a bunch of intro to IR students. I, I could do that in my sleep. Um, most of us could. And most of my classes became that way, where it was very easy. I would be doing all my other stuff and then pick up and walk into class and go, what are we doing today? 50 minutes on uh, free trade issues in the WTO. Okay, here we go, right? When I started doing more online learning, what I realized is that to do this well, there had to be greater intentionality to it. I really had to plan for this. I had to think about what I was teaching. And more importantly, I had to think about why I was doing it. And to me, that is a great benefit because I believe that I have become a better educator, a better teacher um, for my students and for my university uh, than I ever was before. I also think that it benefits the students in that it makes them more self-sufficient. And as I put here, hopefully. Um, and it's important, and I'll talk a little bit about this, but it's important to create a situation where students understand what's expected of them and they understand what is needed to succeed within your class. But 
a big part of that is they have to do this more on their own than just rolling into class three days a week, 50 minutes, and then completing whatever assignments are available. Um, they have to learn time management, uh, especially if you're doing an asynchronous class. Um, I'm struggling with this right now with some of my summer students where uh, they're failing to live up to this self-sufficiency that's necessary. Uh, so I think the benefit is there, uh, but the students have to take that on. They skill build beyond just content, which I think is vitally important. Um, yes, the content of our courses is, is absolutely crucial and absolutely vital, but I think that it's necessary that um, students go beyond that. And in these, this is gonna teach them how to um, engage in groups, be self-sufficient, as I said, um, and for me, really achieve the biggest one, which is learn how to learn. Uh, students in the online world are a little bit more on their own than they are in the classroom. And therefore, they're going to have to learn how to learn, which I believe is a skill that will translate into the future for them. Now, I'm not gonna sugarcoat this and tell you that this is the best and the most wonderful way to teach and there's no drawbacks whatsoever and we should all just embrace this wholeheartedly. There are several drawbacks to this. Um, and I only list a few and I only listed a few of the benefits. You may come up with others. Number one, very imper impersonal. Right? Um, I think there's way to make it, make it much more personable and I think Amanda Rosen, who's gonna talk more about sort of the, the tactics of this uh, can get into that, and we and when we have our um, our remote conference on the in early August, we can talk more about how to do this. But it is limited face to face, and so oftentimes it is much more impersonal. It's time consuming. It's time consuming for faculty to do this. There's no other way to put it. Um, there's a lot that goes into online learning, a lot of planning. If you're going to have that intentionality, it is going to take time. And so you have to be ready for that um, and prepared for that. Otherwise, your class will be, you know, kind of a disaster. Um, so the time has to go into this. I hear a lot about academic integrity and the difficulty of assessing learning, um, especially if you're doing very formal summative, summative type of activities where you're doing in-class exams and things like that. Um, of course, there is software to overcome that. Uh, again, I think this is something that we can get into in early August a bit more, but I do hear this as a drawback often. And I think the biggest drawback is student resistance. And this is interesting though to me. I faced student resistance early on as well when I started doing this. And I do a very informal survey about um, the student experience in my classes, as I'm sure most of us do. And what I found was as students began to become familiar with this, as they began to use it a bit more, as they began to engage it a bit more, that resistance tended to dissipate. And they really started to embrace this. OK, the other thing. And there's so much you could talk about in terms of a, a broader strategic understanding of this. But the other thing that I wanted to just take a few minutes to talk about is this idea of course design and creating a situation for student success. Okay. So the first two kind of go hand in hand. Um, the successful student really needs a clear design to uh, any type of remote learning, whether it's hybrid or whether it's online. I think in many ways, a big part of this is them understanding their responsibility to this. They've got to know what is expected of them. And I think the best way to do this for you as an educator is to think about this in terms of backward design. Most of us are probably familiar with this term, but I think this is a big part of online learning um, and remote learning. And even again, the hybrid learning, which I do a ton of, and that is starting with the learning objectives and designing your course content from that, backwards from that. And that doesn't just mean 
at the course level. That means also at the almost weekly, daily level of, of what you're trying to get in each module of the course. So for instance, um, I'm teaching a global studies course <clears throat> right now, and we just had a discussion of identity and its relationship to immigration. I, in creating that module, designed my um, my course content from a set of learning objectives that I wanted my students to achieve. And that determined what the video would look like that I put out, that determined what the, um, what the course content was, what material they would engage, all of those different things. And I do that on a weekly basis for each module. I start with a set of learning outcomes and objectives, and then I design backwards from that. Um, students find this very helpful. I also make those learning objectives very public to my students. They're up on my Canvas page. This idea of a clear syllabus now um, factors into this. Uh, it has to be accessible. Um, it has to be engaging to some degree. Uh, I know, again, for me, that there, I got to a point where I didn't really think about my syllabus much anymore, that I just had my syllabus canned for intro to IR, and I pull that out and change the dates. Maybe I change the textbook or a few readings and I put it out there and I'd be done. Um, now I really take time so that students can see exactly what is expected of them in the class, uh, that they understand that this very much puts the onus on them in terms of taking ownership over their, their, um, their education. And it's a very learner-centered syllabus in that regard. You need intentionality in terms of the syllabus. Um, you might want to consider, there's lots of these out there, but these syllabus de design review sheets that are out there, uh, you may want to consider using one of them to sort of check off uh, you know, what's needed and what's not needed within your courses. Um, I think one of the biggest things in the syllabus that I put out is, is a rhythm to the course. So that students understand what's expected of them and when it's expected. To me, that's really crucial that students understand that, that there is this sort of rhythm to the course of what the week will look like um, throughout the semester, and then they can follow that, and especially if you're doing an asynchronous class. Make use of, of Canvas or whatever LMS you have, whether it's Blackboard or, or D2L or something else. Um, make the course easy to follow. Make the materials easy to follow. Um, you know, get a hold of a good online course design uh, so that you have an example of this, of what the modules look like, about how clickable it is. And if you haven't done this before, you'll be shocked at how well this can be done. And, you know, in, everything sort of needs to be in this one space so that students can kind of just move their way through within your LMS. Right, and, and discover all of this stuff. Make sure you model what you want from students. Right? If you want a good discussion board, believe it or not, you've got to show them how to have a good discussion board. Um, I actually show students how to watch videos. I'm going to put out a 15-minute lecture to my students. What should they be doing when they watch that 15-minute Panopto video uh, or screencast-o-matic video or you know, whatever it is that they're using? And talk to them about what's needed and what's necessary. They don't under necessarily understand what is expected of them in this online atmosphere, and it's crucial that you make it as um, easy to follow as you can for them. And be engaged. Um, I think it's, it's vitally important that you also are part of the process. Um, don't don't just think that you put this information out there and then that's it, you walk away. You have to be part of this process, maybe even more so than in the class. And there has to be an intentionality at, about it and students have to see what you're doing on a constant basis. All right, look, those are just some really broad strokes uh, concerning online learning and, and how you may approach this from sort of this broad strategical. Uh, Amanda Rosen is going to talk a little bit more in 
um, these early videos about some tactical understandings of, of how you might do this. So I hope you got something out of this and I hope to see you guys in early August where we can drill down on a bit of this uh, information that I've provided today. Uh, have a little back and forth conversation about um, what you need in your courses um, and hopefully set you up for a, a great fall and, and some success in terms of remote learning. I'm going to focus on tactical approaches, uh, primarily simulations and games and how we can do them in an online setting. So simulation games are great for online learning, actually. Um, they have a long history of being used in our discipline, so that's nothing new. And we do know that they can be very effective tools in achieving our learning outcomes. And one of the areas that particularly excel is in creating engaging experiences that can help build community um, between students and between students and faculty. And that's really what we're looking for right now. In an online setting, we've lost a lot of that from the loss of the physical classroom. So we want to find ways to take games even though most of our games have been made for a physical classroom and figure out ways to bring them online. So we need options. So we have five, well, really four. The first one is just simulations and games or SAGs that are just too physical to move online easily and effectively. Not that it can't be done, it's just gonna be probably too difficult to do, particularly if we don't have a lot of time before the start of classes. Second, we have um, simulations and games that were actually designed for an online format and meant to be used that way and can just be brought out of the box and used. Then you have those that you might typically play in a physical space, but actually are also in an online form. So you can play pretty much exactly the same game, just online. Then we have games that can be pretty easily translated to a synchronous or asynchronous setting. And then finally, those games that are going to take some work in order to be moved online. So let's start with the ones that are hard to do. Uh, this is Dalig and Vadan, and this is an example of a very physical game that's gonna be hard to move online and achieve the same things. Um, it's essentially a capture the flag style game. You've got two teams, they each have a commander that can't move and production centers, and you win by killing the commander or capturing production centers. Um, and this is, game is meant to illustrate, uh, from, it's meant to illustrate um, the Clausewitz ideas of fog and friction. And so, for example, the team commanders can't move, they have to shout orders, troops may or may not hear those orders or obey them. So it's really physical, it's played on sports fields, um, and it's not going to be easy to just move this to an online setting um, and achieve the same learning objectives that you might have. So there's some games that we just really can't work with very easily. Then we have those that have actually been designed for an online format. So two examples of those. Uh, first, we have uh, Statecraft. This is an IR simulation um, played entirely online. Teams will control fictional countries, decide their form of government, and make decisions about war and peace, what to do about terrorism, how to combat climate change, um, all within a set online system. Uh, Icons is a example of role-playing case-based simulations, again, played through a web platform um, on different crisis scenarios or cases that you might encounter um, when you're teaching IR. So both of these are great options because they're already web-based. Um, you can sign up and they kind of run without a lot of instructor um, input. Uh, so there's not as much a leg room for the instructors to do. They are, these two both do require fees, so they're not free, um, but there are other games that just exist online already and you can um, find some of those uh, on the Active Learning and Political Science uh, blog and other uh, resources. Our next category are games you might typically play in a physical space, but exist in an online world. Um, Diplomacy is a great example of a game like this. It's a board game um, that you may have played in your classroom, but there are many different online uh, systems for playing diplomacy uh, for free uh, or for fees um, online. So, you know, IR scholars have long recognized the utility of a game where you make students play pre-World War I countries and then fight it out in a realist system of competition. Uh, so in, you know, diplomacy, you know, you have to build alliances with other players in order to capture territory, but ultimately you're going to need to betray those alliances if you want to win, because um, there can usually only be one winner. I once had two winners, um, but that was because I had two students uh, get a notarized peace treaty, dividing up the extra credit points between them, and I just thought it was so creative I had to give it to them. Um, this is a game, if you've never played it before, that can create a lot of tension. My friends refuse to play it with me, but I will say, for the record, I did have two students students get married after playing this game. So it is not all conflict. There is some cooperation involved here as well. 
Our next set of games are games that are usually played uh, in a physical space, but can pretty easily be moved to a synchronous or asynchronous platform. So Werewolf is an example of this. Um, you may know it as uh, Mafia. It is a casual party game, but I use it to teach political violence, the dangers of democracy, authoritarianism, social control. Uh, if you're not familiar with the game, uh, basically you divide your students up. Most of them are villagers. Some are werewolves. The werewolves are trying to secretly kill the villagers. Um, every round, the villagers have to um, discuss amongst themselves who they think is a werewolf, and through some me democratic mechanism, choose choose one of their own to um, kill or imprison um, as a werewolf. And the game ends when either the villagers discover all the werewolves or the werewolves kill almost all the villagers. Uh, so I really love this game, but it actually even works better online than it does physically. Um, in the game, when the werewolves are choosing their victims, um, usually everyone's eyes are closed for the night phase and the werewolves are kind of trying to coordinate with each other and point. And so a lot of times people can use their physical movements if they hear someone move or they see that their arm is moved and use that as information in the game. Um, also, people who've already died in the game can see who the werewolves are because their eyes are open, um, and they might make a stray remark to give it away. But if you play on Zoom, you just tell everyone to turn their videos off during that phase, and then the werewolves communicate by private chat and then message the moderator to say who they're going to kill. So none of that information is available. And given that the lesson of werewolf is that we they never question that I told them there are werewolves amongst them and that they're killing each, and they just choose their choose from amongst their own to kill without proper trials or evidence or anything, simply because I told them so. So it's a great way to talk about authoritarianism, and when you take that information out of the game using the blanking the videos, it makes it even better. So I love this game, very easily played on Zoom. Another example is model diplomacy. These come from uh, the Council on Foreign Relations. And these are case-based simulations of either the US National Security Council or the United Nations Security Council. Um, they're great, they vary in length from something that'll take two hours to something that can take weeks. And you can play them asynchronously or synchronously. So you could do it over Zoom and have students give their positions um, and debate through Zoom, through the chat and through the voice and use breakout rooms for small group discussion. Or you can play it asynchronously on a platform like Discord, which is usually used by like video gamers, um, but is a great way to have ongoing text and voice chat. So you can set up channels, text channels, as you can see here, for uh, public spaces as well as private spaces. You can control who can access or even see a channel, who can talk in them, how often they can talk, and you can have voice channels as well as the text channels. Um, so this is a nice uh, free platform you might want to explore if you're interested in running um, simulations. Our final category are simulations and games that require a bit of creative work. Um, and the example I'm going to give here is Bowling for Extra Credit. So these are similar to Dalek and Vadan, your physical games, but some of them actually could be brought online if you're just a little creative. So Bowling for Extra Credit, the main premise here is to teach structure. Uh, this is part of the Comparative Politics Game Show. So you the idea is you divide students up by their ability, their stated ability, and then you put them in front of a box and for different distances from the box, and they have to throw a ball into the box. So some students are going to stand right in front of the box, others 15 feet away, and others all the way in the back of the room. The idea here is, is that structure matters. Some people who stand really close are going to fail, and some people who stand really far away may actually get the ball in the box. But the structure of where they're sitting and the rules of the game matter a lot. And when students complain about it not being fair, that opens up a lot of avenues for discussion and how that relates to um, political science. But this is going to be a little difficult to do in a virtual space if you think of it as throwing balls into boxes. I don't think of it that way. Instead, I'm thinking of it as a game um, some kind of a game where ability is going to matter and be affected by different conditions, something that can accommodate groups, and something that's very visual, where people can kind of see what each other are doing so they can all benefit from the lesson. So what I came up with was Pictionary. Um, meets all of those requirements. So what you can do with Pictionary is you divide people into groups, you ask them about their ability in drawing or Pictionary itself, and then uh, you give one set of students an easy word to draw uh, with only about a minute of time. If you've never played Pictionary, basically 
teams are given words. One member, of the, one member of the team is given a word, they have to draw it, the other members of the team have to guess it. So you do that, only you give one team an easy word and a lot of time, another team an easy word without a lot of time, and then the third team you give them a difficult word and very little time. Uh, I would, by the way, fall into the very low ability uh, category. So uh, you can see here is my version of Pictionary. I did an easy word for a minute. I drew a zebra, or that's what it's supposed to be. And I had a difficult word um, log in for my 30 second. It's definitely possible for the team with a lot of time and an easy word to not get it. And it's possible for the team with a difficult word to get it. But the structure is going to matter. And that's the point. So that's it. Play more games. Don't be afraid of playing games. There's a lot of games out there in an online space that you can use or translate pretty readily to an online world. Don't give up the act of learning. It's still important, maybe even more important that we're not in a physical room. So please use your games and simulations. Um, don't forget to sign up for Pandemic Pedagogy and uh, check out all of your resources for getting more um, information and ideas on what we can do in the classroom. Back to Jeff and Jamie. Thanks very much to Amanda and to Eric and to all of you. This is a webinar that's preparing us for the more in-depth kind of conversations we're going to have when we get to the August workshop. And we're very thankful that you're here to see what we've got planned for you. Yeah, that's right, Jamie. We really want to thank our presenters for the webinar today and let you know that they're among some of the great folks who will be involved in our workshop, our virtual experience coming up for Monday, August 3rd. So this is an initiative sponsored by ISA and the Innovative Pedagogy Program. Um, it is co-sponsored by uh, our many wonderful supporters. And it will be a live virtual workshop focused on pandemic pedagogy, Monday, August 3rd, from 12 noon to 4 p.m. Eastern Time in the United States. You could join us from anywhere around the world and have a chance to interact with your peers and colleagues in a series of informational sessions, as well as breakout conversations. A great opportunity for us to brainstorm about challenges in the pandemic era and for professional networking. The ISA website, the main website for the association, will host registration information. And that'll be coming up very soon. We'll also promote that widely and encourage you and all of your colleagues to join us for that great interactive workshop. Thanks again for being here with us today for the webinar, and we look forward to seeing you soon. Thank you.